glorious domination. Casey Joyner, ESPN.com, NFL insider, with a look at how the Eagles were so dominating, so glorious, Pete Thompson. Sure looked good to me. I was there. I was in the stands. I was singing that song three times in the first quarter alone. Casey Joyner, 34-7. We see the Eagles with a big W yesterday. Let's start off with, boy, there's so many ways we can go about this. Uh, but how about the Eagles' defense going after the Cardinals' offensive line? They basically dominated the line of scrimmage. They were all over Carson Palmer. They had a couple of sacks. They got uh, their hands on a bunch of balls in the secondary. Uh, Jim Schwartz, he was one of my keys to the game. Schwartz against Arians, and it seemed that Schwartz outfoxed Arians yesterday. Uh, big time, and you could tell – the Eagles were saying, we're going to come after this offensive line. We talked at the end of last week about what was the you know, biggest mi- potential mismatch, and it was the Eagles' front seven versus the Cardinals' struggling line. And, and the Eagles blitzed on 32.6% of their plays. You could see on running plays, they they were just pinning their ears back. It just it didn't matter what Arizona was doing. They just did just get upfield like they were playing on the Arizona side of the ball. And even though they only got a couple of sacks, they held Arizona to 7.9 yards per attempt on vertical passes, in part because of the blitzing. And Arizona did not complete a stretch vertical pass. That's where you throw it 20 more yards downfield. They tried five of them, completed nothing. So that pressure was really a key to the game. Um, and, and with that, I guess that says that the secondary plays well because if you're going down the field and taking shots, a lot of times it's one-on-one matchups with outside receivers taking on corners, uh, outside corners, and the Eagles' corners uh, matched up pretty well. Yeah, I think what they thought is, is it was kind of similar to what Jacksonville did with uh, with Ben. And uh, they, I think the Eagles said, look, we're going to blitz. We may not get there, but we're going to make sure when when we blitz, you're going to react a particular way. Because the Cardinals threw 18 vertical passes yesterday. That's the most they've thrown this season. I think they figured, you do that. We know you're going to respond in this way. We don't think Palmer's that accurate, and we think if we know what you're going to be doing, it's going to allow us to be in the proper position to stop these plays. So even though they only got pressure on 21.7% of their their pass rushes, which is the eighth lowest total this week, they really didn't get that much pressure, but it made the Cardinals even more one-dimensional in their passing game and it let the Eagles just sit on the routes. Um, and when you look at uh, the Eagles, you know, uh, that means they're getting pressure from four, right? And they're doing it without Fletcher Cox. That's a pretty impressive stat in itself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the thing is, like I said, I I think that even the Eagles are saying, even if we don't necessarily get pressure, we're going to make you play as if we're getting after you because you know the 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 Cardinals want to be that type of offense. But again, when you're when you're blitzing, you you're adjusting routes and saying, okay, somebody's coming out of the secondary, so we're going to throw this type of route and things. You're not just you know you don't want to let them just sit back and say we're going to run all of our our uh, route concepts at you. We want to make sure that you're doing particular things. And I think they also figured that Palmer was a guy who could put a lot, you know, who will force passes in the coverage. And if you make him think a blitz is coming, it makes him a little more jittery than he is in normal cases. Uh, The Cardinals blitzing the Eagles as well. I mean, they came after the Eagles. They tried to send some pressure their way, uh, but it didn't seem to work. Some of that's Carson Wentz, but a lot of it, I guess, is that Eagle offensive line, which week to week now, it seems like we keep talking about. Yeah, and the, the Cardinals blitzed 38.2 percent of dropbacks. That's the 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 what, I think the fifth highest mark in Week Five. It's a fair thought. If you're blitzing that much, you're blitzing a lot. But the Eagles averaged 10.6 yards per attempt against the blitz, the fourth highest total of this week, and a really really good total. So. Uh, it's the offensive line just just holds up exceptionally well, both uh, running the ball and passing the ball. And you know the Cardinals they they tried to do what they could to to make Wentz jittery, but I mean it just didn't see you know Wentz is I think he's beginning to realize that I've got one of the best offensive lines in the NFL and I can trust them, and that's making him a little more relaxed early in the games than he used to be, and that that's a big plus. If we can keep that up. Hey KC on Friday's show, I heard you mention Justin Bethel and the Eagles went <laughs> after him on that. Torrey Smith touchdown added another dimension to the Eagles offense. Torrey Smith certainly did. Yes, Torrey Smith. You got to remember, he's only a couple of years removed from ranking second in the league in vertical yards per attempt. I mean, I know he he didn't do quite that well last year, and he, uh, he's ta- he's not he's probably not quite what he used to be. But it wasn't that long ago that he was a dominant vertical threat. And Justin Bethel, that's the thing. People talk about the secondary, and Matthew is good, and Peterson's a top-notch guy, but. Bill Walsh used to say years ago that all you that on defense, it's all about talent because if you have any player who isn't up to par you know, talent-wise, the offense can find a way to single that player out and go after him. And I think that's what the Eagles do with Bethel. They said, Bethel, you're not Peterson. You're not Matthew. You're not that good in coverage. We can get after you. And they hit them. Yeah, that's who Smith beat for the 59-yard touchdown. 
And Casey, is it time to start believing in Nelson Aguilar? If so, what do you make of the Eagles wide receiver group now? Because then you'd have Aguilar, you'd have Smith, you'd also have uh, Alshon Jeffrey. Aguilar's looking like he did in college. It was like when he did well in preseason camp, I remember uh, talking to, to an NFL reporter about it, and the NFL reporter was like, yeah, he's doing good in camp because he's going up against the Eagles cornerbacks. Don't read much into it. Huh. But he didn't get going up against those cornerbacks before, and he hadn't done well. So he, yeah, I, it is time, I think, to believe in him as at least a, uh, you know, a, a guy who can – more than fill the role for this offense. He could be that possession receiver because now you got Ertz who's just tearing it up down the middle of the field. you got Aguilar on the dink and dunks. you got Jeffrey who's the all-around threat. He can beat you on every level. You know, Smith is an over-the-top guy. I mean, the Eagles now have a lot of ways with these targets to be able to go after people, a defense in any way they want to, and, and that's before even taking into account the running game. Hey, uh, let's talk about the running game because the Eagles run blocking again. Uh, they seem like, and this is a good, we talked Friday about this is a pretty good Arizona front in terms of stop in the run. They're one of the top teams, uh, top 10 in the league in stopping the run. And the Eagles, you know, they didn't have a day like they did against San Diego or like they did against the Giants, but they probably could have had they chose to. Yeah, they uh, they came into the game with a 41.7% mark and a metric I have called good blocking rate. It measures how often an offense gives a ball carrier good blocking. And that was a top 10, top 10 mark, and they had a 42.1% mark against the Cardinals. Again, the Cardinals, we talked on, on Friday, are they going, you know, they will run the ball. They're not going to just get away from it, but can they have success? They did, but here's the thing that really stood out. The Eagles gained 10.6 yards per carry when they got good blocking. The league average is 7.7, and any time you're in double, digit, in double digits in that uh, metric, you're doing an exceptional job. In fact, over the past two weeks, the Eagles have averaged 9.8 yards on good blocking plays, which is just a, a phenomenal number. So I, that says that this offensive line is really starting to gel. Uh, on the flip side, the Eagles, uh, we touched on a little bit, but we know Arizona couldn't run the ball. Uh, but the Eagles, the big thing with them is uh, the, the way they stop the run. I'm talking about down the road. Is this a, I don't want to say an elite, but is this a very good run-stopping defense that you need to have once you get into December, January football if you make it that far? Well, it's, yeah, it's one of those things where you you had to take what they did yesterday with a grain of salt because Arizona is not a very good uh, offense, and they only allowed a 28% good blocking rate. That's that's you know that that's a, a terribly low number, and they just destroy Arizona. Had to do the Arizona only only way they were getting good blocking is with all right, we're running end of rounds, okay, we're doing a draw, or we're doing some kind of a subterfuge. They're saying, look, we can't block you straight up. We have to do something to try and trick you to create some space. But the Eagles for the season, they're allowing 34.4% good blocking rate, which is a really good number. If you're below 40 in that category, you're doing very good. And they didn't allow any really big gainers yesterday either, and that would have been a problem for them. So they're going to win their share of, of – Good blocking runs in their share of blocking uh, opportunities, but if they can also keep those big gainers from happening, which they did yesterday, I think yeah, this can be the kind of run defense that if you put them up against Dallas in a, an important game down the road, they could at least hold Elliott somewhat in check and, and limit and limit that upside there. KC Mike gives me a lot of grief since I always seem to gravitate toward the kickers, and you know Jake Elliott steps up hits the sixty-one yarder, it makes the news, but. Yesterday, Kenyon Barner and the special teams. How about Barner stepping in for Sproles and the kicking units and the special teams units in general? Yeah, he's, he did that. some of that in college and things. You, you could see why he's you know was a home run threat in college. And ESPN Stats and Information has a metric called special teams expected points added. It basically measures the impact that special teams have, so specifically based on, you know, on, play, on you know, play values and things of that nature. But the Eagles gained – had a 7.4 mark in that category, which basically means that the special teams added seven points to the scoreboard. And that was the third best mark in week five. And it's the kind of thing that says, okay, this is uh, can be a potential impact special teams. Can you start getting kickers who can hit long field goals? You start getting returns like this. You can start, and this this can be, I think the Eagles, say they've rated really well in this category before. I think they'd be a top 10 team in this category by season's end. Hey, you know, one of the things we're going to be talking about probably uh, when we discuss this Eagles uh, Carol line of game is no Lane Johnson. That looks like he's going to be out. And the line difference when he was out last year, we know they were two and eight without him, five and one with them. Obviously, uh, very good with with him this year. How much will that disrupt? Do you think the Eagles' offensive line, or did Vitai improve enough that it shouldn't be as big of a noticeable drop off as it was last year? I think it won't be as big of a noticeable drop off. I think that in the running game. 
look, the Eagles did very well in the running game last year without him. Over the course of the whole season, they they found a way to to do well with that. So I'm not too concerned about how it's going to impact the running game. A bit more concerned about how it is in the passing game. But I think Vitae has progressed to the point where you can put somebody to chip. You can do things of that nature. You can put those things out there and and, and kind of limit what his downside is. And again, when you've got this many ways to attack a defense, the defense can think, okay, we need want to attack this this weakness. But if you can make them think. You gotta stop Aguilar. You gotta stop Birch. You gotta start Smith. You gotta stop Jeffrey. We can also run the ball at you. It makes the defense not able to spend as much time uh, going after that weakness. So I, I, it concerns me, but I not as much as it would have last year. All right, let's look around the league with Casey Joyner. Get a couple quick thoughts on some of the key matchups. How about Dallas last night? Second loss in a row at home. Big game for Dak. But what overall is uh, the problem with this team? Now they scored a bunch, so offensively, 31 points. They gave up 35, which shouldn't be a surprise here. But what stands out about why the Cowboys are 2-3 and three after losing to Green Bay. We've known their pass defense is kind of weak. Their rush defense looked bad. Green Bay came into the game with one of the lowest good blocking yards for attempt totals in the league. Yesterday they allowed they gained 8.5 yards per good blocking attempt, which is above the league average. Some of that is Aaron Jones, who looks really good, but I mean it says that Dallas's run defense is abysmal. So they're going to get in a lot of low percentage shootouts, and that's that's not a good situation for them. Uh, let's look at uh, Seattle going on the road to beat the Rams. Even when the Rams have not been very good, they've given the Seahawks problems. Uh, but this was a close game. Seattle had scored the most points in the league. What did you learn about the Rams in their loss yesterday? Um, their offensive line had come into that league arguably as the best offensive line of the NFL, and Seattle handled them, and I did not think that that would be the case. So it makes me question, not that the Rams don't have a good offensive line, but are they going to be elite like they were the first few weeks, or is what we saw yesterday going to be more par for the course or the summer between? Because if their offensive line takes a step back, it's really going to limit that offense. Uh, Raiders in trouble? Got to get Carr back. Manuel is not What's wrong with their they... defense? What do you mean, Carr? Yeah. They, they, get, they got 30 <laughs> yesterday to the Ravens. <laughs> I still think that they need Carr back because it, it, it changes the dynamic of what their team. Their defense is terrible. Uh, their run defense hasn't been playing well. Their offensive line, though, honestly, their offensive line is not graded out that well. So I think they've got a slew of issues. They still, if they don't get Carr back, though, I mean, it's. I think it just changes the whole dynamic of what they can do. Okay, explain to us Jaguars Steelers in two sentences. Go. <laughs> Jaguars flitched one time yesterday. One time. That's it. They said, Ben, you can't beat us deep, and Ben couldn't beat him deep. Is he true when he says, maybe I'm slipping? I think so. He Last year, he threw 18 touchdown passes when teams didn't blitz. So far through five games, he has one touchdown pass when other teams don't blitz. They're saying, we don't have to blitz you. We don't think you can beat us deep. And so far, he hasn't proven them wrong. And if he can't mm. do that, Steelers are done. Casey Joyner, ESPN.com. Dolphins, uh, what happened with the Titans, man? I mean, I know uh, Mariota's out, but uh, they should, you know, Castle's been a guy who's won some games in this league. Yeah, there, but their run, their run blocking has fallen back with Mariota out. Right, and we thought the, they had the, one of the best offensive lines in the league. Yep, and they're still, they're still not, they're not terrible, but they're nowhere near what they were last year. Actually, they were for the first game or two of the season, but they've really taken a step back. And with Mariota out there, I think defense is safe. Fine, we're just going to stop you running mm-hmm. against Castle, try and beat us, and I don't think he can. Uh, what you learn about the Panthers in that game against the Lions? I mean, that game's in Detroit. They go on the road and win that game. So, I mean, is this Panthers team closer to that fifteen and one team? Scary for the for the Lions had one of the it was that was going to be a run game mismatch. The Lions run defense is terrible, and the Carolina blocking was as, run blocking was about as good as can be. The Lions loaded the box on twenty five plays. They stopped the run, shut down the Carolina running game, but but Cam destroyed them when they loaded the box. Twelve of sixteen for nearly two hundred yards and three touchdowns. It says you can't just sit down on the Panthers running game because Cam's going to beat you up top. Uh, you buying the Jets? I'm buying them as not being as the worst team in football like they looked at at first. I don't think they're going to be. I don't think they can keep this up. But uh, you know, they, they've, the schedule's been favorable to them too. But uh, I, they, they're not. Hey, they're not going to be in the Sam Darnold uh, race right now. Um, and uh, how about the Bills going on the road? Was that a disappointment? I mean, we talk about um, one of the words we use is equity. You know, building equity with each win, and then when you lose a game that you build enough equity that that game just seems to be a blip more than, okay, I can't buy them. The Bills win that game last week in Atlanta, and I want to buy into you, and then you lose in Cincinnati. So they didn't build enough equity to take them serious yet. No, they didn't. They've got a lot of uh, elements, but Tredavious White and Chase Mode against uh, A.J. Green, that that can happen more, more frequently than you'd like to. And they still just don't have enough of those, uh, those big weapons on offense. I think that's the difference. You've got a guy like A.J. Green versus you look at the Bills' offense and say, where's your big play guy? He can do a lot of things, but you've got a big play guy. Now they're big play guys in L.A. 
Uh, Casey Joyner tonight. It's uh, Sam Bradford back. No cook. He's done for the year. Trubisky in. Thoughts on the Monday nighter? Uh, Minnesota's run blocking is part of why uh, Cook was doing so well. I think they're still going to be very good at run blocking. Uh, I think that having uh, Bradford back is a huge plus. I think Chicago, I think Trubisky, look, I was one of the few guys who said that Trubisky, that the Bears should have traded up to get him. I thought that the Browns actually should have taken him at once, so I like his future. But this is the first game against a tough run defense, tough secondary. I think Minnesota wins this game handily. All right. Uh, he's Casey Joyner, ESPN.com NFL Insider. And uh, we'll have to uh, discuss what's going on in the later week. The Eagles play on Thursday, so uh, maybe we'll do a little switcheroo here uh, and get Casey's take on that game later on in the week. And, of course, you can catch Casey Joyner here on the Sports Bash 97.3 ESPN and follow him on Twitter for all of his takes, whether it be fantasy, pro wrestling, or NFL at KC Joyner TFS. Thank you, pal. Appreciate it.